Oh, thank you. Hey, well, welcome to, to session number one. I'm glad everyone could stave off hangovers and uh, what not to, uh, to be here. Hopefully, this, um, hopefully the talk is worth your while. Uh, Luke and I are here today to talk about the future. <laughs> um, oh, no. Already. Already they're in the one. future, there are never any tech problems. Yeah, because it's all done by AI. Cool. All right, no, we're okay. This, um, yes, yeah, so I know we kind of got introduced. Luke and I, we work with XWP. Um, that's a, like a WordPress agency that um, is kind of here in Australia and around the world, and we do sort of large-scale uh, WordPress things. Um, and, and, yeah, like we are... When we say we want to talk about the future today, we're not necessarily talking about the, the 100 years from now interstellar space travel sci-fi kind of stuff that you're probably much more interested in. Um, you know, we're, we're talking like the, the 2020s and like the, the near future and some aspects of technology that are that far away. I mean, 2020 sounds so distant, doesn't it? But really, it's just over a year away. One year away, it's, right? It's like a year and a couple of months away, 2020. So we're really just here to talk about the next 5, 10, 15 max years so that we're not trying to make these crazy forecasts about AI uh, working collaboratively with humanity to create a beautiful, shared, blissful utopia, but actually um, just looking at the stones that are already rolling and being able to predict where they're going to land in the, just the next few years. Yeah, I think it's important we start with like just a little thought experiment to help shape any conversations that we have about the future. Think with me for a second. If, the, if we were to go back in time you know, 200 years to, say, 1818 and, and take sort of a random person off the, the cobblestone streets and bring them forward in time... Uh, and to, to this day and age, and for them to encounter the amount of technological development that we live and breathe every single day, and for them to see these metal boxes hurling at hundreds of kilometers up the road, huge metal things shooting through the sky across continents, um, you know, speaking um, to screens with people talking back from the other side of the world in real time. I mean, then they're not even the cool ones. I mean, that we have an international space station, and someone recently shot a car into space, and you know, um, and, and music that plays wirelessly from things sitting around. I mean, all, all the things that we, you know, we probably just tend to take for granted. But for someone to come from the context of 1818 to 2018, the experience will be so jarring that you could probably suggest this person would actually have a mental breakdown trying to comprehend the current nature of, of what we're able to do. I mean, I, I have a mental breakdown when I try to comprehend it, and I'm not even from 1818. There you go. Well, maybe you are. Uh, well, think, think this, right? Let's say we go back to 1818, and we go back 200 more years to, like, 1618, and we find someone and bring them forward to 1818. Now, the rate of change over that time, you know, they might be mildly impressed by some of the, you know, some aspects of technology. Maybe some in early industrialization is happening. Maybe some more commerce. Maybe some more travel exposure to other cultures and ideas. But certainly not to the level that this person is going to have a mental breakdown. They might be just mildly impressed. Because, you see, our, our mistake often is to think that technological development is, is linear. That it happens in a straight line rather than exponential. And, you see... Technology changes over time, um, you know, in this in this exponential way. And as you know, futurists, maybe you've, you've heard of Ray Kurzweil. You know, he talks about this the uh, the concept of accelerated returns. That the more we advance, the faster we get at advancing. And that from the year, the rate of change in the year two thousand was like five times the rate of change for the entire hundred years before that. In fact, that he would suggest that at the rate of change of the, the year 2000, it would only take about 20 years to accomplish an entire century's worth of change. But as we get faster, he suggests that then it drops down to about five in about seven years. And he's suggesting that um, by about, he kind of suggested by about now, by 2020, we could see an entire century's worth of change several times in a year. And our mistake would be to think that the future looks like the past. I mean, we don't think that, but our mistake would really be to think that the future will change in the same rate as the past. We're heading into a future, t like 10 and 15 years away from us, that could be so radically different. It could be like pulling you from 200 years ago to now. 
The same change to go from now to 2030, right? Maybe 2025. We, we, we could be being wild, but there's no reason to not think that's the case. Now, all that said, though, Brendan, oh, yeah, yeah. We're, even though exponential change should be expected, what we're doing today is looking at a couple of pieces of key technology that we can see progression in over time and just forecasting that out at a regular rate of change. So even though some of the things that we're going to be talking about might even seem a little fantastical to you, they should be considered as more conservative guesses. Yeah. I mean, and the, and the whole point of this is that if we, if we fail to plan, we, we plan to fail. I mean, in the year 2000, um, you know, Reed Hastings, the, the CEO of Netflix at the time, went to the CEO of Blockbuster and said, hey, I'd like to kind of handle your, your online division and, and what you're doing here got laughed out of the room. I mean, we know the story. Ten years later, Net, uh, Blockbuster is bankrupt, and Netflix is worth ten times the amount Blockbuster was ever worth. You know, the, the reason we're here talking about this is so that we can kind of just identify some areas that are at least interesting and think, well, what could we be doing to prepare um, for the future? And unfortunately, you have to listen to us talk about that for the, <laughs> the next little while. These, these are the four areas that we might... We're just going to dance through these really quickly, and you could spend a whole talk on any one of them. So please, let's, we're just going to dance very quickly through self-sovereign identity, social data, AR and VR, and the Internet things. Luke, kick us off with... Self-sovereign identity. Those might be three words you've never heard put together before. Has anybody heard of that concept? Very, very few people, and some of them only because I've talked to you about it before. Um, but I think this, this is going to be an idea that we see come up more and more uh, and even become a really important part of culture over the next 10 years or so. So you might be thinking, what the heck is self-sovereign identity? Well, let me explain it with another term you might be more familiar with is the word blockchain. Who's heard of that word? Well, you might be thinking, what the heck is the blockchain? And that's a whole talk in itself. Uh, I, I won't dive too much into it, except to say that you can think of the blockchain as a way of securely storing data in a distributed way. Uh, so you probably think of, when you think of the blockchain, you probably think of cryptocurrencies, right? It's synonymous with Bitcoin and Ethereum. But although... These cryptocurrencies, they are built on the blockchain technology. The blockchain isn't limited to only servicing these financial technologies. We can use the blockchain for other things. So what if you took all of your personal data, all of the information about yourself, your name, your address, your passport, your driver's license, your email address, your phone number, all of that personal information and stored it safely and securely on a blockchain in a distributed manner. So we're not doing that right now. And instead, we have a different sort of system. It's more centralized and also, at the same time, more scattered. So we've got three kind of big problems at the moment. One is security. Google and Facebook, in the, just the last couple of months, have revealed massive data breaches. So our data that is stored in these centralized places, it's not secure at all. Uh, another one is that it's so inconvenient. If you change your email address or if you change your name, you've got to update it on every single platform that, that you're a part of, and that becomes extremely onerous and probably next to impossible in a lot of cases. And the third thing is you don't own any of that data. That online store that you visited two years ago to buy some fiddly it's a fidget cube or a spinner and they, they probably still have your name, your email address, your address stored on their servers ready to be hacked and that's not a good system so self-sovereign identity solves this by using the blockchain because the blockchain is secure uh, it means that you can uh, uh, take that data and assign, you can see this piece and this piece, and you, third party, can see that piece and that piece, and I might even be able to set an expiry so that, uh, yes, WordCamp, you can see my name and my Twitter handle for the next three months, and then no longer will you be able to have access to the, that information. Right? And it's owned by you, which means that all of that data, it's, it's yours. 
you take it with you around the web, where you don't have all of these usernames and passwords for every single site that you visit, but instead you just prove that you're you and you can assign bits and pieces of information to be read by any third-party website you visit. So no more usernames and passwords, and they don't have to store any information about you. Uh, And so we've got this sort of system in place where you control your data, it's safe, it's secure, uh, and it's sort of a huge big win for privacy. This might seem like a, a big dream that would be really difficult to imagine. But actually, there was an organization instituted last year called the Distributed... I um, can't remember. But uh, basically, centered around this idea, uh, it, it contains parties like IBM and Microsoft, so big players, and they've already got a draft proposal for the format to the W3C. So you can go to the W3C now and, and look at how this system might be formatted, what it would be structured like. And in addition to that, there's another group called ID2020 who's organizing a, a huge conference at the UN specifically to bring this issue of self-sovereign identity to the United Nations. So I think that by 2023, by 2024 maybe, we'll start to see this idea of self-sovereign identity enter our vocabularies more. Uh, it might, we might start to see early versions of it. And hopefully by the end of the 2020s, it becomes much more prevalent around the internet. Cool. Um, let's change tacks here for a little bit. Similar but connected. Um, you know, data collection, big data, these kind of terms, they, they, you know, they're going around a lot right now. I would, I would suggest everyone in this room has been hearing about this kind of being branded, especially by uh, the marketing companies out there doing this stuff. Um, but it's, it's really worth our consideration for, for what's happening right now. See, social data... Is, is, is the change, you know, that, that data essentially up until quite recently was kind of these items of information that were collected about people in general. But you see so much of data now is actually collected in relation to an IP address or a device or a social media account and so on. And that data now that's generated is actually attributed to individuals. And so data is becoming socialized in the way that the data doesn't represent a group of people, it represents a group of individuals. And, you know, think about even 10 or 15 years ago, the kind of data points that you were giving off for people to harvest or to understand about you were probably relatively minimal. So maybe some of what you were buying and I think the the, the use of cash in society obviously allowed people to make anonymous purchases. But by and large, you know, we tend not to do that so much anymore. But just in any given day, where you are, what you're doing, what you like, everything you're buying who you're hanging out with and where you're working, where you're living, all these kind of things like constantly, constantly, you know, and especially when, you know, if you think about the services you engage, like for travel, for with Airbnb and Uber and Uber Eats, what you're eating, what you're doing, where you're flying, where you're staying, what your preferences are and who you're with. I mean, all these things are now, they're, they're getting mapped. And data's being collected now really more than ever. If you put it this way, like out of the say billion or so people right now generating data on that scale, they're generating thousands of data points each per year. So that's per day. So it's trillions of data points per day. And altogether, the amount of social data collected doubles every 18 months. So what was collected in the entire year in about 2001 now is collected in a single day. And we expect that in just a couple of years, the amount of data collected over the entire year of 2001 will be collected in under an hour. And we have to kind of start thinking about the, the implications of this, because not only is the data being able to be collected, you know, computation learning, smart learning, uh, you know, machine learning and so on, um, when you couple these activities together, that data is being collected at a, at a rate and an expense that is, is far greater than ever. Computational power is getting far beyond what we'd ever imagined. And then, um, and machines are able to actually intelligently learn and understand you and understand us. You know, we have to think about um, what that means for us and for our, our future. Now, um, you know, I, 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 won't, I won't go on and on. I think you kind of get this idea, but... I think that there's a couple of things that we do need to be aware of looking forward. And, and, and mostly, like, when we think about the price that we pay for all this convenience, 
We, we do. I mean, to use services like Google Maps, yeah, this is amazing. I, I love it. I mean, I can just look and it tells me, like, yes, there's traffic here. Don't go that way. Go this way. I look at that service to me is, like, amazing. And I'm definitely okay with giving up my, uh, my location for that service. But, you know, when you start to multiply that out and beyond, we have to think about, you know, the, the price we pay when companies, uh, when, when profile aggregators, like, PayPal, AdSense, I don't know, you start to think about these aggregation companies that are getting just vast amounts of your, not only your internet data, but they combine that with perhaps medical data, perhaps genetic data one day, perhaps location data, family data, what your children are doing, and really profiling you down. The price that, you know, you, you pay, I think for much of that con- consumer level data will be the ability to be manipulated easily. Like to, the, to an extent that we don't understand what's even happening and that we're, we're unable to even cope with and to, to react to that. I know I think about my kids and what they're going to go through. Just because of my stupid behaviors online, they're going to be these amazing profiles of my boys by the time they turn 12 or 13, just from the data I generate on them, nothing that they've done. And, and, th- and that they will be ripe for manipulation by companies who know their, everything about them and what they should be doing. You know, we have to think about that. I mean, there's, a, there's another realm for security and surveillance. I mean, the price you pay for security in, in order to be, you know, to, to lose your privacy, that's another piece of this that we, we don't need to go into. But, but I don't want to remain all doom and gloom. You know, the problems that we'll be able to solve. I mean, humanity is a long way off, and we'll, we'll touch this later, a long way off from solving the problems that we can and living the kind of lives that we we should as people, and the, the processing of data, um, the collection of it, and the use, the use of it intelligently, and let's hope ethically, I think will be, you know, can pave a, a beautiful experience for many of us into the future. We just have to kind of be, be aware of this, I think, where it's headed, um, and we want probably two main things that I tend to think of things that we should be looking for, and for many of us in the room, perhaps giving. I mean, if you, are, if you are a site owner, a product owner, a service giver, you know, you fall into the category of people probably doing this, right? Um, that we, we seek transparency of what we're doing and choice for people to participate and be involved in things that they probably aren't understanding or equipped to deal with. Lee. Okay. In the same way we were hand-wavy about the future, uh, we can also do it. Virtual reality. <laughs> so... In the same way that personal computers transformed the entire globe in the 1990s, and in the same way that the internet just changed the world in the noughties, and in the 2010s, smartphones completely transformed society, how we communicate to each other, I really believe that the 2020s is the decade of virtual and augmented reality. Virtual and augmented reality are already, you know, have come quite a long way. In fact, I'd hazard a guess that there's a good number in this, of people in this room who have tried you know, modern day VR. Put your hand up if you've, you've tried VR already. So uh, around 50% of people here. And of course, everyone's tried augmented reality. Put your hand up if you've not played Pokemon Go. Ooh. Oh, what? No, you're lying. Guys, come on. You're lying. Don't be ashamed. <laughs> I, I know some people who still play Pokemon wow. Go. Uh, anyway. Woodsy. Um, <laughs> so, actual, actually, VR isn't a new technology. It was invented in the 1960s and really heavily studied in American universities alongside other reality-bending, reality-building ideas like nanotechnology, lucid dreaming, and, of course, everyone's favorite, psychedelics. Wow. Uh, and so there, there's a little bit of a connection there. But these days... Uh, VR has really progressed to the point where it's consumer ready. You can go and buy a VR headset off the shelf. And granted, right now it's still a little bit out of reach in terms of finances for most people. This one here is a standalone AR headset. So you see through the lenses and it puts things back into your eye, add ads to the world. Uh, and you can buy these in the United States right now for about two and a half thousand dollars. My home VR setup, which is sort of state of the art consumer VR, costs around three hundred, uh, sorry, three and a half thousand dollars, and that was a little bit over a year ago. So it's a little bit out of reach for most people. But the technology is ad- continuing to advance at, at a quite a fast pace, and the price is continuing to come down to the point where next year. Oculus are releasing a headset 
called the Quest, you should look out for it, which has full room scale tracking, so you can walk around your environment, full hand presence, so you can see your hands in VR, and state of the art optics, you know, like high resolution displays, for 400 US dollars. You don't need a computer to power it standalone. So I think this product in and of itself will be pretty world-changing, but you can really imagine that by 2021, 2022, VR and AR will have their iPhone moment where they start to really enter common use in society. Right? And it's going to start influencing the way we educate, the way we entertain, uh, and, uh, I mean, what better way to learn about the planet? So I sat with my son, and we sat together in a, uh, a rocket ship, and we were surrounded by the stars, and we traveled through the planets at the speed of light. We could change our scale so we were as big as the sun, and we experienced this together while we learned about the planets. What better way uh, to learn about the planets than to experience it? So when we start to think about how is this going to influence the web, there is one thing that I think that we need to keep in mind to ground us. And that is that for thousands of years, humans have communicated in 2D with the written word, with pictures, paintings. And so I don't think that in the next 10, 20 years, we're going to suddenly transform the way we communicate mathematic, uh, ma mathematics or, or poetry into some weird 3D art form. But instead of uh, you know, making Wikipedia in 3D, I think what we'll start to see instead is VR and AR providing additional context to the content on the web. So if you're a web developer here, maybe you want to start thinking about what sort of space would my content best be presented in? How could I set the mood with the environment around the viewer or, or around the person who's experiencing this website? Uh, and you can really start to think out of the box in terms of how is my 2D information displayed? It doesn't have to be in a square window. It can be in any particular place in 3D space. So that's something that's, that's really interesting. It's always about providing context. And the other thing, as a web developer, you can start to think about is uh, providing um, embeddable 3D objects. So you've got images, you've got videos, and maybe you have a 3D embed. With this magically uh, thing that, that I showed you earlier, you can put this thing on, read a news article in a virtual monitor, and the right now, like this is present day, you can see you're reading about a flood and on the New York Times website, and it shows you the water level in the room to give you an idea, right? Giving you all of this extra context. So that's how we should think about how AR and VR is going to affect the web. Uh, over to you. Yeah, sure. Um, the, the, the IOT, I mean, this is, um, you know, once again, a concept that I think for, you know, most people are fairly well uh, aware of. We're watching it happen and, and certainly not anything particularly new. But I think the thing to be aware of here, much like the, the data piece is actually, you know, kind of the, the scale of projection and, and the scale of where this is headed. Um, you know, international research firm Gartner, um, you know, they suggested there were about 3.8 billion devices, you know, online and 2016, that by, you know, into early 2020, suggesting it'll be as much as 25 billion. Uh, the outgoing um, CEO of, uh, of Cisco, who might have a vested in interest in projecting this high, but, um, but, but you know, he's, he's believing that by around, you know, 2030, 50, 50 billion, you know, mid-2020s, mid um, you know, 50 billion devices, a $19 trillion industry. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's worth considering, I think, the way that we, we conduct ourselves and live our lives and what it means for devices everywhere we go um, to be connected. I mean, can, you know, think about, like, um, um, you know, from, from every aspect of your home, from a toaster to the thermostat to the front door um, to your car to your phone to your watch to every activity that your car will, will, will do as you move through. Um, your, your daily lives. I mean, cars, you know, becoming, um, you know, connected devices that, you know, are also driverless as well, if you combine the two things, become an entirely different experience. 
I mean, when you don't need to drive in a car, it just becomes like a, this transportation method. Um, why wouldn't you have a desk in the car and work on the way to work? Why wouldn't you have a treadmill or a bike and get some exercise while you're, while you're heading there? If you needed to head to Sydney, why wouldn't you just sleep in, the, sleep in a bed in the car on the way to, on the way to Sydney uh, and then on the way back home again? Um, you know, the, the way that this will transform our experiences and the hotel industry and trend, you know, these kind of things is, is really significant. But it's not even those really significant things. It's also the insignificant things that have a huge impact as well. In, in Philadelphia right now, they have like these so-called smart bins that are measuring the amount of waste in their bins right now and communicating that back to the, the council, as it were. But if you think about the way we do garbage collection right now, we just run around every week and collect all the bins, right? Regardless of how full or empty they are. But they're, they're seeing enormous efficiency here, savings in wages. And I mean, think of that, you know, there's also environmental impact as well, but, um, but fuel and wages and, and, and trucks, you know, in knowing the specific bins that need changing. In Israel right now, they have so-called smart highways that have sensors built into the roads that scan the number plates of people who move into the fast lane and charge them at a, at a higher rate to use... Um, their highways by scanning the number plates and charging their, their credit cards. There are startups for, for for drones that are connected that guide you to a car park. And obviously, I don't know if you spend any time in New York, they have a pretty sophisticated public transport system where every piece of public transport is connected again and you get this incredible experience of understanding where you are and where every vehicle are is in relation to you. But I mean, aside from the consumer experience, it's the efficiency that can be brought into the world because of this and the, uh, the reduction of cost, the reduction of environment and mental impact you can see because of these things. I mean, um, you know, the efficiency for the New York com- commuting system was to see that trains went from an average of roughly 15 per hour to 26 per hour just by bringing them onto the grid and bringing some intelligence to that system. So, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's it, you know, one of those things that I think um, really takes us to, to think about a day in the life of what you experience and to look at every possible thing that could be connected in your home and what that would mean for those things to be, um, to be speaking to each other. And then you mix that with, with data collection and learning and to think that those things are learning about you and the way that you live your life. And as, as providers, as web providers that we are, we, we really need to think about um, not so much, you know, I mean, in AR and VR, we might think about how we experience the internet, uh, how we experience the web, but where we experience it as well, and what it will mean for for all these um, all, all these devices, you know, billions and billions, and everything we touch to be to be connected, to be learning, uh, and to be adapting to the way that we you know live our lives. Um, let me just close in a in a thought here. Um, I, I gave a, a talk just recently on the future of, of work to a, a bunch of grade grade twelve students. And I, you know, obviously giving the talk, like, you know, when you think about the future all the time, like it's, you know, you kind of get used to thinking about some of the possible dystopian concepts and, and the onslaught of what's kind of coming. And I, and I could see to them it was quite a jarring experience, to, especially when you combine some of these concepts with automation, with artificial intelligence, robotics, and what that will possibly do to the state of the world in the next 15 and 20 years. And a student, a young girl came up to me afterwards and she was like, well... What's going to happen to us? Like, what are we, what are we going to do? What are we as people going to do? And I was like, well, look, you know, it's not the first revolution that humanity has been through. It's possible that this one is very different, and we don't want to be naive about this. I mean, we saw, you know, what happened to horses during, you know, the the, the motor motor vehicle revolution. You know, we didn't find a new new use for horses. They actually just became completely redundant. Horse population uh, peaked in 1912 and has never never recovered. Right, but. Um, but I think it's important to think that, the, and I, I quote the words of futurist Gerd Leonard in saying that the future is more exciting than we think. That there's so much for us as people to do. So, you know, if you think about um, the way we experience medical care around the world, the, what we're doing to our environment, the kind of lives that we lead, there are so many problems to solve. There are so many places that we can go and we can improve as a, as a people that... Um, I choose to take the perspective that technology will lead us on to solve bigger and better problems in a way that is is great for for all of us. And uh, I'm not, uh, I don't believe in being na- naive about the future. I believe that we aren't blockbusters, being ill prepared for the future. But I'm not out there to you know to be scared of the future, to be frightened. 
I choose to think like that we can be optimistic about the future of our world uh, and that, you know, if I even think about what WordPress represents and who we are in this community, you know, being partakers and, and owners of a third of the web, you know, our, our responsibility for the piece of the future that we are projecting towards as well and what all of our personal responsibilities are in seeing the future for us and our children that we want to see exist. Cool. Anything Great. you want to add to that? Well, uh, I, w- I would say in your words, cool beans. Cool beans. Cool beans. All right, cool. That's um, that's the talk. I think that's... Um, uh, oh, yeah. Do we, yeah. I,